Happy New Year, folks. I just released a new version of GeoPortal. GeoPortal is our local government frequently asked questions kind of portal site. So you can figure out where your kids are going to go to school or when your trash is going to be picked up or whether you should buy big buckets for the next time it rains. Things that your citizens really need to know. And it's been one of our uh, most popular sites. It gets around 20 to 25,000 users a month. And the current site, as of today, is on your right. The old site is on the left. Now, the old site did very well, and I like it, but there are things where I look at it today with new eyes and I see some design problems. One of the big problems is these things over on the left. These are your, how you get to different kinds of data, like voting and parks and all this stuff. The problem is I have this over here and you click on it and you get a whole lot of nothing because you haven't selected an address yet. So I have things you can click on that do nothing. That's a design problem. That should not be the case. The other problem is, is this becomes a hamburger menu as you shrink this down. And now you've effectively hidden those things from most of your users. And hamburger menus are, are great for things that uh, are necessary but not important things a user might need one out of every 20 times. But these things were critical to using the site. So having those in a hamburger menu was a design mistake. Another problem with uh, this is that it was, uh, it's like monophonic, but for data, I don't know what that is. But what it is, you can see one of these at a time. And the thing is, is, you know, people, even in 2020, like to print out everything. And if you wanted to print out parks and libraries and voting, you've got three different print jobs to do. And that's not very friendly. Printing itself is also pretty crap. It, um, see, it's, it's, it's just basically like, I hit a few things on the screen and otherwise just flung all that crap right at uh, your printer. It is, it prints, and I wouldn't say anything else nice about it. Uh, performance was, for a government website, especially GIS, a, a mapping related site, is excellent, but not as good as I wanted it to be, particularly on mobile. And there are various other design elements, like the size of some of these tables, the fonts are a little small, and, and, and there were just design issues I had with it. So I decided to redo it, and uh, when I did that, I always use these opportunities to try out new things, and one of the things I want to try out is a framework called Svelte. Svelte is a really interesting JavaScript framework. It, it's a framework like Vue or React, but it, it essentially is designed to go away. With Vue or React, it produces code that your browser executes to make a virtual DOM and interact via Vue and React. Svelte doesn't do that. It doesn't make a virtual DOM. Svelte essentially, when it compiles, goes away. And it makes for really tiny JavaScript and really fast JavaScript. So you can also make components uh, with, with very little amount of boilerplate and code. I really like working with Svelte. But let me show you what the new site, how it interacts. One, you get this. Uh, it is a much, much cleaner layout. Over on the left, there's a lot of different stuff for you to look at and try to figure out what to do first. Here, you've really got two things you can do. You can search or you can watch a video that's going to tell you to search. So no more uh, shaking the, uh, no more shaking this top thing at you if, if you clicked on the wrong thing. There's not a wrong thing to click on. It's a much cleaner layout. The footer has a lot more information in our Twitter handle because that's how people contact us for support now. It's, it's really via Twitter. And I'll have links to like where to get the source code for this and, and all that kinds of stuff. So now you do a search and pick an address. And now those things that were over on the left are hidden behind a hamburger. 
are up front and visible and they're only now showing because you can actually do something with them. So here we have our schools. We have much larger fonts on the tables. It's much easier to read. And if you want to pick more than one thing, you can. Now you have two things on the map and it'll automatically scroll down to uh, whatever's the latest thing you picked if it's not visible on the screen. And here we have our parks. If you scroll down a ways, you'll get this little arrow that'll let you automatically scroll back up. Now the map is optional on a lot of these tabs and sometimes there won't be a map like trash and recycling, no map. But for schools, you can click on that and it'll show you where your schools are. Notice how the map is designed for this site. And this is Mapbox Geo. The major roads in this top bar are colored with the site's colors. This orange color is part of the highlight color for the site. This top bar is, is straight, this bottom bar or the bottom corners are rounded with a very subtle shadow to make it look like it's coming off the page slightly. It's designed just for this site and, and it, I have to say I'm really happy with this map. Looks good. That's what, that's what that looks like. Uh, you can add as many as you want. When you go to print, uh, I think this will launch a print preview for us. It has this really nice cover page, which you don't see unless you're printing. And then each one of these data tabs will print out and it will do a page break after every data tab. And you can have as many as you want on there. So now you have very, very good looking quality report you can print out for your location with whatever data you wanted to see for that. So yeah. That's how that looks. I should also mention that the, the tables are now responsive. Before on GeoPortal, when you're looking on a narrow phone, the tables would involve some horizontal scrolling, and horizontal scrolling sucks. Oh, and this, when you get down to a certain level, your table is going to switch to this card layout, where everything, all of those rows are on different card with the table headers off to the left. That makes for a very nice narrow screen mobile phone uh, type of, you know what I'm saying. It's a good thing. Now for performance, see what we got going on there. This top one is uh, the performance of the old site. And this is performance for, this is Lighthouse score for uh, slow 4G and a 4X CPU slowdown. So this is essentially performance on mobile. And here we're seeing, you know, generally good scores. This 86 for performance is not great. Time to interactive 5.6 uh, seconds is not great. Um, not super happy with that. Now this 86 is better than pretty much every government website you'll run into, but still, we we want we want you know we want fireworks. Now if we look down here, now this uh, other thing, this 759 kilobytes, that's stuff that the uh, service worker is caching, so we can kind of ignore that. But just on initial page load, we're talking uh, 257 kilobytes of JavaScript, 26 kilobytes of CSS, 22 kilobytes of images, 11 kilobytes of document. We're talking about a fairly, I mean, realistically, 300, 350 kilobytes for a web page that does anything is, is not very much, but it's still more than I would like. Now down here at the bottom, this is the score for the new site. And notice we've got perfect across the board. And ah, ah, this just makes me so happy. Time to interactive is 0.8 seconds. 0.8 seconds. So that is a much better uh, 5.6 seconds to 0.8 for a site that essentially does everything and more of the old site does is really great. If we look down here to the requests, if we look at script 34 kilobytes. And I'm going to tell you how I did this. Style sheet is eight kilobytes. So our scripts for the initial page load or, or the, the home page experience is down by over 220 kilobytes. It's, it's a fraction of the size. CSS is way down. 
uh, everything's down. Images, image size down. The the document size is down. Style style sheets went from 26 kilobytes to eight. And most of that eight kilobytes is actually uh, Mapbox GL related stuff. I'm going to tell you about uh, some of the things I did to build all this here in a second. But this is the performance difference. And on a phone, and really on anything, but particularly on a mobile device, you can feel this different. It feels different. So let's talk about how I built this stuff. Uh, let's see. I know, I know you're old. You need, you need bigger. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make it bigger. Okay. Now, the build environment here is Webpack, which I had to build by hand like an animal. That, that is the one thing I would say Svelte does not have. Uh, Vue has the Vue CLI. React has the, the whole Create React app. Uh, Vue has a couple of very, very, very Spartan templates for Webpack and Rollup. And beyond that, you're on your own. So that's one downer about Svelte. Uh, they do have a framework called Sapper, which it may address some of that. I didn't try it. But uh, yeah, you're going to have to be building some of this by hand, which uh, after the Vue CLI spoiled me, it, it, hurt. It, it hurt a lot. But you can get it to work. It's not too bad. I'll show you the Webpack configuration. It's basically cleans up some folders. There's our entry point. Down here, we're processing our, our we're doing our Babel stuff. And then we're doing some stuff particular for Svelte and pre-processing post CSS in the Svelte uh, modules, components. A little CSS. It's not bad. This is a hundred lines of Webpack, which is, I think the Vue CLI's Webpack config, I tried out putting it once and it's like 2,000 lines of madness. So it wasn't bad, but it, you're still going to be doing a little bit of elbow work on your build tools and uh, it's not fun for anyone, but it wasn't bad. Now for the CSS, and the reason why the CSS is much smaller than it usually is, or it was was before, is I'm using Tailwind CSS, and I'm using Purge CSS. Tailwind is a CSS framework that, it's not a component framework, it's like a utility framework. So there's not like a Tailwind CSS button that styles buttons in a certain way. What you would do is you'd make a button and apply a whole bunch of different Tailwind classes. Like here I'm giving it some padding on the X and the Y. I'm making the button rounded. I'm giving it a little transition. I'm a uh, white space no wrap, inline flex center. These are all just different utility classes in Tailwind, and that's how you build a button. And what that means for me is the actual CSS I wrote, there's that, that. This is, this is really the stuff I wrote by hand, this tiny little bit of stuff. There's a little bit of Mapbox GL related stuff there, but I had to write almost no CSS, and it's all being essentially built. So when I make something uh, like a div in a certain style, I just string out a bunch of Tailwind utility classes. That's how it works. Now when it goes to build, it's using a tool called Purge CSS, which is a post CSS tool. And what it does is essentially looks through whatever you give it to look through. Here are HTML and that, you know, Svelte components. And anything that is a class it doesn't see, it just it just tosses it. So if you didn't do that, your CSS with Tailwind would be like, you know, 100 plus kilobytes of stuff. Or it comes out now, gzipped, it's about 8 kilobytes. And most of this is Mapbox GL, because I'm telling it here specifically, don't throw out that stuff. Uh, tree shaking in CSS is, is really not a thing. It's, it's, it's kind of a kludge. So if you have something where the classes aren't instantiated at all until after load, like say a Mapbox GL map, 
uh, Perch CSS can't tell that those classes are really being used. So here I'm telling it, if you see Matt Box GL in the class name, just, just keep it because we're going to need it. And, and that's how that works. So I don't, there's no perfect way to, to tree shake CSS. You, you've always have to have some exceptions in it. But that's how it builds a super tiny bit of CSS. And Tailwind was a pleasure to work with. That's how we do the CSS um, for code splitting. How I get the JavaScript so small, because you're thinking, you know, 36 kilobytes, you can't do maps with 36 kilobytes of JavaScript. And you're right. I'm doing something called code splitting. Code splitting is where you, rather than building one big bundle, you build chunks of JavaScript and load them as you need it. Now, when I first load the page, uh, what I need is this search box working and this little YouTube video thing working, and that's it. I don't need anything else running at this point. Now, after you find an address, it loads its next chunk. The next chunk is the app code that does all of these different data tabs. Now that chunk gzipped is only like, I think it's like 20 kilobytes. So it is also quite tiny. Now the map, that's the mother load because Mapbox GL does a lot of really cool stuff, but you pay for it because it's big. When you go to load a map, not until that point does Mapbox GL code load. And that's the 250 odd kilobyte gzipped monster. But if you never click on show me a map and you don't really need to for GeoPortal, you never have to have that performance hit. The only neat thing about being a progressive web app is that stuff is cached. It's not, uh, it's not uh, parsed and executed, but it's already cached. So when I hit show map, it's already got that JavaScript. It's just loaded it in the background. Huh? Huh? So that's what code splitting is doing for us. And the code splitting would look something, give you, show you where it does the map. Let's see. Uh, components map. So what I'm doing is I have this button. This is the button that toggles. When you click that button, it toggles this variable show map to true or false. And if it's true, this is the import syntax for this kind of dynamic import in JavaScript. And I'm going import mapbox GL, and then I'm having that import map itself to GL. And then after that's done, I can have it run the create map. So this is how we're telling our build tool that we want this in a separate chunk and to load that on the fly as we need it. So it's really not that hard to get set up. I mean, you have you can't really you can't really spaghetti code with this kind of thing. It's got to be proper, you know, componenty sort of stuff because you have to make sure those interdependencies are that that code is isolated. If this bit bit of code here affected all the code and all this other stuff, then then you can't really really do uh, code splitting like that. But in this case, this is where we do the map and back on uh, app loader. This is where we do the same sort of thing if show app is true. That set if we have an actual long lat location to get data for. That's how we do code splitting. And that is what makes the page so incredibly performant by taking our gigantic Mapbox GL or whatever else and putting it somewhere else. Now, what's I gonna tell you? Oh, let's talk about polyfilling because I did all this work on this and then pulled up in Internet Explorer and I just cried and cried and cried because it was not happy with it. And it was all a matter of Internet Explorer needing different polyfills. And I found a really cool way to do that. Now, uh, one thing 
you have to polyfill for I-11 is a promise. And I'm doing that right at the top. So every, every browser, regardless whether it needs or not, takes this little bit of, gets this little bit of code. And it's less than a kilobyte gzip, so it's not bad. But if you don't, if it can't do a promise, you're screwed right off the bat. So you really need to do this to do your the rest of your polyfills. Now, if if uh, support service worker, so it can support a PWA, I on I do a chunked out load, or for this uh, for register service worker. And this is just chunked out here because I want it to run uh, whenever this has happened. This, so this isn't really a polyfill thing. This is just only run this uh, if it's a modern browser. Now I'm making this array of polyfills and I'm saying if the browser doesn't have window fetch, then I, I do a patch polyfill and I just dump core.js right down his throat. And core.js is, uh, a lot of ES6 monkey patching for IE11. And I do the same thing with intersection observer. So if it's not in window, then push that that import into this polyfills array. And then I do a promise all for that polyfills array. So what is done doing all of that stuff, it actually instantiates the app. Now, if it didn't need any of this, this polyfill array is empty. So this executes immediately. So this is how I'm doing polyfilling where it only happens for browsers that need it. And it does these chunks so none of the other browsers have to pay for it. And this is a little bit uh, more efficient than doing like a polyfill IO because it's got, has to do that polyfill IO uh, execution. Whether it polyfill IO decides to send down any patches or not, it still has to hit that resource and, and do that stuff. So this is a very efficient way to do polyfills and have them be not included in the JavaScript you're shipping everywhere. And God, was there anything else you can show? Oh, the tables. How it was pretty easy to do a responsive table. I'm essentially just, uh, uh, if it's below a certain screen size, I'm, I'm turning off the table head. I'm setting the, the table rows to a block and uh, in the table rows, I'm doing a, uh, this data label attribute. So uh, that doesn't show normally, but I, when it's on a small screen, it actually puts those in and flows them to the left. And that's how it makes, that, that's a very quick and dirty way to make a responsive table. So it goes in that cart kind of layout. And there's probably a million other things I learned along the way. I learned about uh, this pre-connect thing. Uh, Prefetch just tells the browser that they're, they're going to need this stuff and start loading it as soon as you can. Pre-connect is telling it that it's telling the browser to go ahead and make a connection and a DNS lookup in TLS handshake to these locations because this is stuff it's going to need for, for analytics. And that greatly speeds it along when it goes to the actual analytics. So I have analytics turned on and it's still getting hundreds across the board for performance. Yeah, this code is all on GitHub and the new geo portal is live. There are already some things I've seen that I want to improve, but overall I'm very happy with it. And feel free to use the code however you want to. It's MIT licensed. We don't care. Anyway, I hope you're having a great new year. I will catch you later. Bye-bye.